Thank you. Thanks, Shireen. Yeah, hi, my name's Joseph Lindo Davies, and I'm here to talk about the work I'm doing in my school and community with utilizing and celebrating a plant-based diet with young people. Now, I've been an educator for over 20 years, and in that time, I've had thousands of students, and for the last seven years, I've had the privilege of raising these two lovely humans. And in that time, I've thought long and hard about what it best to teach young people in a world of infinite possibilities where you care deeply about their future. Now, there's already some general consensus about what's best to teach young people. It's widely understood that we should teach them how to read, how to write, and how to do mathematics, despite these being particularly difficult and challenging skills, but it's worth it when you get there. Other things I'd like to suggest we could add to this list, I've been an advocate and beneficiary of PE and movement my whole life, um, is teaching young people how to move and how to swim. These are liberating activities that are difficult to learn, but also worthwhile. The last 12 years of my career, I have spent my primary time focused on food education. I've seen firsthand its power to transform the lives of young people and communities, and sadly, we've never needed it more. The national food system is well and truly broken. Unbelievably, diet is now the number one cause of death and disability in the UK, resulting in a rising burden of obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, unbelievably, also a third of children aged 5 to 10 eat less than one portion of veg a day and diets low in vegetables are associated with nearly 20,000 premature deaths every year. It's getting worse, not better. Here you can see obesity rates going up by 50% between 2019 and 2020. And sadly, this is felt in the lower socioeconomic groups. There's a huge inequality to health and it should be every child's right to be able to afford and to access healthy food. We don't talk about obesity to shame body shape or size, merely because along with diet, it accounts for up to 40% of chronic disease risk. When we talk about eating healthfully, we're talking about eating more fruits, more veggies, whole grains and less meat. This was also confirmed by the National Food Strategy, who Shireen earlier was saying doesn't go far enough, but we can see here, we do need to change the national diet if we're gonna meet health, climate, and nature commitments. The best example of this, we believe, is a whole food plant-based diet, which has been shown to reduce the risks of these diseases. A small change can make a big difference to young people's lives. Just one additional portion of veg can reduce the risk of mortality between five and 16%. It's clear that whole food, plant-based nutrition is the answer. But how do we get there? Well, I think the first step is we need a massive culture shift. We have to move away from the current global standard diet and we have to move towards a plant predominant or a plant exclusive diet. It's tempting to think that we should normalize this diet, but there is an issue with the term normal. Normal is divisive. Normal implies that there's a right or a wrong way of doing it. Um, a, a better term I came across during Pride Month was usualize. Usual, when we usualize something, we climatize people to its presence. We take away the threat of difference, which creates fear and discrimination. And this is absolutely what we must do with plant-based lifestyles. I'm in the privileged position to create and um, curate the food education for about 600 young people every year. And I was absolutely determined to expose them to this kind of diet. Um, and in doing so, I created one of, if not the only plant predominant curriculums in the country. This is the year seven and eight curriculum at the moment. Um, and we teach them core cooking skills, but also we celebrate life on the plants. We teach them how to use tofu. We teach them um, knife skills. We teach them that eating healthily can also be exciting and affordable. Sadly, we do have to include plants, um, animal proteins, but when we do so, it is the second choice. The norm is vegan, and then the, um, they opt in with the animal diet. You can see here, and um, we've got the jerk squash with rice and peas, and then it's up to them. I'm um, sorry if the, the mic, um, the sound adjustment. It's up to them to opt in. Here's the kind of dish that I think could change the world. It's, I love Indian food. Um, this is a dal. It's healthy, it's nutritious, it's exciting, it's comforting, and it's extremely affordable. The problem with it is, is when I was excited about putting it on the curriculum, the kids didn't know what dal was. They wondered what it was. They said it was a spicy lentil soup. They weren't really looking that excited. We changed it to lentil curry. We served it with a coconut naan. And this is a great tip if you're trying to get people to try something new, try it with something popular and something familiar that they already enjoy. Vegetables massively benefit from branding, like everything else. 
in a primary school, they renamed carrots, x-ray carrots, and it increased consumption by 62%. I mean, that's massive. You, know, you could really change the hearts and minds of young people and all people in the UK with adjectives, imagine. But the problem is, is that only 1.9% of soft food, drink, and advertising goes towards promoting vegetables, and clearly this needs to change. Here's another dish that I love. Um, I grew up eating cauliflower cheese, which was great, um, but actually it, it really, I think it's selling the cauliflower short and all plants. If you roast cauliflower, it turns into something much more magical. Cauliflower korma though, again, it wasn't very popular. So we renamed it aromatic korma and then we gave the kids the choice of which plants to include. They could do potato, they could do tofu, they could do mushrooms. And watching teenage boys and girls devour plates of roasted cauliflower is an enduring um, experience that we look forward to. Salad has also got a bad rep. Here's our super salad. We use dishes like this to teach young people that food can be exciting um, without animal products. It's about texture and flavor and color that really gets food going and gets people excited about it. Sadly, vegan is um, a term that's also misunderstood. Um, for some, it's a dirty word. It has negative association and it's really doing a lot of harm, this negative association with veganism. Um, I've heard this a few times. Tragically, I really wanted to go vegan, but my parents wouldn't let me. We obviously contacted these parents and spoke to them and reassured them, but you can't imagine how many of these um, conversations are happening without us knowing about it. It's amazing too and sad that, as we know as health professionals, that a well-planned plant-based diet can support healthy living at all life stages. And how can there be so much hate for a movement steeped in love? Veganism, after all, is a philosophy and way of living that seeks to exclude um, all forms of exploitation and cruelty for the benefit of us all. Sorry, let's go have a quick drink. Is plant-based the answer? I think the, the short answer to this is yes, with the plant-based health professionals after all. And I've seen that plant-based is a lot less negative in terms of getting people to try this food. But plant-based does not mean healthy. But I saw these unhealthy plant-based foods as an opportunity to educate, as is our nature. And we play a game called vegan or not, where we teach young people about veganism um, and what might be included in these vegan products. And we try a range of snacks, crisps. We think about gelatin, we think about dairy. The big reveal at the end is that all the snacks are vegan. And it just shows young people that they can have vegan food in their diet, even if they're not. And also the word vegan isn't a term for health, although it can be and should be. This leads us on to the role of plant-based meat alternatives. Um, I think these foods are good transitional foods. They're a good way to get people to see vegan food in a different light. So I created this lesson, sausage, chips, and greens. And we use this plate to teach them several things. Firstly, we compare the nutritional content of animal, which I intentionally chose higher welfare, um, intentionally chose higher welfare sausages versus meat-free sausages. They're quick to point out there's five times as much fat in the meat, in the meat version and twice as many saturates. Um, but we must talk about protein. We, I don't think we're gonna get through a vegan lecture without discussing protein, but we reassure them quickly that even people following plant-based diets get 70% more protein than they need. So maybe that's the end of that conversation, I doubt it. Also, the plant-based sausages, although this is not the best place to get this from, and anything helps, they contain the life-saving food that 90% of people aren't eating enough of, which is, of course, fiber. Here's the reimagined Eat Well Guide. And the reason people aren't getting enough fiber is because people are just not following these guidelines. Out of a million people, you'd be staggered to know it's only 78 out of a million that follow the Eat Well Guide. It clearly needs a rethink. And um, we've had a lot more success with the Eat Well Canada, which represents the lifestyle model that Shireen showed earlier. And um, it's just so much more visually pleasing. The industry is removed. It's based in the nutritional science. It's a clear message. And it's not that, it's much easier to match the plate up. I'm not saying this is an optimum plate of nutrition. Yeah, we'd rather see tempeh or tofu or legumes, perhaps a whole grain on the right. But actually compared to what people are eating, this plate is a huge step forward. And if you're wondering here if kids go for this, they will. They queue up for broccoli um, that's well seasoned and served in this way. Notable points from here are that you can see here the fibers down at 9% rather than 30 as discussed, but I, I still can never believe this statistic when I see it. Um, if fruit and veg is at 8%, snacks is at 12%. We're eating 50% more snacks than vegetables. 
Um, it's mind-boggling. And on that note, we're eating a lot of crisps too, and young people are eating a lot of crisps. The British Heart Foundation famously warned that half of all children were in effect drinking five litres of cooking oil a year. Um, it's a shocking image, isn't it? And actually, one in five have two packets of crisps a day. I wanted to ask the question whether or not can we tempt kids away from these um, processed snacks? And the answer is yes. Here we go, this is year seven, this is lesson two. We teach them a bean dip formula, they personalize it, they add orange zest, they add garlic, and they love creating these plates and trying each other's dips. And young people, absolutely, we, we've got to give them more credit. They will eat this food if they're given the chance. Here's another statistic that I'm sure you won't enjoy. Half of the amount of time is spent in the kitchen since the 80s. It was one hour in 1980, it's now 34 minutes. And the most popular food prepared in a British home for lunch and dinner is now the sandwich. And if you're not eating a sandwich, you're eating ultra processed foods. These are industrialized foods. They're both hyper palatable and unsatiating. They contain very few micronutrients or fiber and they are high in salt, fat and sugar. And I think we've actually known for a long time what happens if you eat too many ultra processed foods. You're gonna get a stomach ache or worse. And what was the solution for the very hungry caterpillar? It was of course a nice green leaf. There has absolutely been a narrowing of the diet. Baked beans and pizza contribute to 16% of children's vegetable intake. And I asked the question, could we tempt kids away from these brown beige foods? The answer is, you'll be pleased to hear, yes. Here is a ratatouille, hugely helped by the PR of the Disney movie, I'm gonna to have to say. But for many, this is the first time these young people will have seen or eaten an aubergine. They've heard or found out about a yellow courgette and they've had eight or nine different plants in one meal. The smell of roasting Mediterranean vegetables is alluring and they get their friends in at lunchtime. And again, here you see we're using garlic bread to encourage and entice young people to dip and try new foods. Kids wanna have fun. They see the face in the salad. They see the swan in the apple. They see the watermelon elephant. Who knew? There's also been a narrowing of vocabulary, and this is a huge, huge problem um, that we're facing. The, if we all went now, we wouldn't have to go far to one of the best restaurants in the world, and each of you ate the best meal you'd ever had, and I asked you how it was. You would use one of maybe five to 10 words to describe it. It would be delicious, it would be yummy, it would be awesome. Uh, and the issues with using this limited vocabulary is there's no space for the world between delicious and disgusting. There's no space between sweet and bitter. The food industry know all about this and they're not interested in you diversifying their diet. They'll sell you what you like and that is sweetness. We have sweet kiwis, we have even sweeter yellow kiwis. We got rid of the words mandarin, clementine and satsuma and replaced it with sweet easy peeler. We like sweets so much we've made cotton candy grapes. I wasn't a big fan of Brussels sprouts and this debittering isn't all bad. If, if we can sweeten up some of these bitter brassicas and get more young people to eat them, fine. Um, but there is a price to pay. Sweet veg are less healthy. So what's the answer? Well, I actually found it in this book. B. Wilson's um, brand of food journalism is amazing and I highly recommend her work to you. This actually, fortunately for me and my family came out when my first daughter was born in 2015. And in this book, I found out many things, but I found out about the French word sapere, which is the French verb to know, to understand and to taste. It's the same verb. And it's this knowing and understanding that we don't have. This created what has been massive success in our school and uh, nationally and in all the countries that have embraced it. It's called Flavor School. And in Flavor School, we remove the words good and yummy and delicious, and instead we focus on the sensory qualities of food. You might think about the crunch of a crisp or the sweet pop of a pea in your mouth or the juiciness of an apple. There are so many words to describe food that we're not using. And through understanding and exploring these things, young people do try more food than they had before. These are the five flavors, if you're wondering. Bitter, umami, sweet, salt, and sour. And we distill these flavors into liquid form. And young people cannot tell the difference. It feels like it's gonna be obvious, but we need to learn how to eat with our senses like we need to learn all things. This is our favorite game in Flavor School. If you've not tried this, I strongly recommend you give it a go. We take a strawberry, you hold your nose, and you start eating the strawberry. The first thing you'll get is 
juicy texture and then maybe a bit of chewiness and then if you let go of your nose it's like all the lights have come on it's an incredible moment and it teaches us all that there's so much we don't understand about how we interact with food and that's because we don't actively pursue it we've had success but the science tells us it's also successful. 60% tried unfamiliar foods compared to 35%. And kids who try more food, we're talking about these food explorers, they also have better mental health and they're going to follow a better dietary pattern. Now, sadly, I've seen mental health deteriorate massively in schools. So this is a real issue. And hopefully fruits and vegetables and flavor school and programs like it can be part of the solution. So we have brave food explorers. Um, we've, um, we've usualized the plant-based diet, but have we climbed the mountain of celebrating plant-based food? Well, not quite, but instead of thinking about an increased amount of work, I'd like you to think about getting back into the kitchen as one of the best investments you could do or you can do to a young person in your family or community. In this kitchen, you're gonna be learning some basic skills and the more you do it, the better and more fun you're gonna have. You're not gonna need a lot of equipment, but you are going to need to lay out your kitchen. We call this mise en place. I talked about this in much more detail in my previous talk, the whole food plant-based diet at home, which is on the channel. Um, but let me share some of the highlights. You're going to need some knife skills. And it's kind of, I like to think of it as a craft. It's something that you can invest in over time and really master. And the more you put into it, the more skillful you'll be able to prepare and quickly. Because, you know, we're all busy people and our, our kids, um, we've all got busy lives. So if you can invest in these skills and control the temperatures key, you turn it down, you tease out the flavor, you turn it up, you increase the browning or the Maillard reaction. Here's a crispy cauliflower um, with perfectly controlled temperature. Acidity is key. Add it to your foods and balance the flavor brilliantly. Now, there is too much salt in the diet. I remember in Shireen's um, talk earlier, sodium was the, one of the leading problems, but this doesn't really come from cooking. It comes from ultra processed foods, takeaway snacks. I think um, we're never going to turn people to the whole food plant based diet if we can't season this food properly. Um, and, and seasoning is an art and an enjoyable art. And not, not to um, say we can't only use salt in this quest, we can also use um, spices and herbs. This is great. This is B12 flakes, another alternative to seasoning, um, which leads us nicely onto fat. Now, I think that fat particularly is not all the same as it cold pressed oils are much healthier for us, but we are going to need to use some fat to crisp up some of these foods and to give it the mouthfeel and comforting textures that we're used to. Um, if we're going to go up against the classic British food and there's other cuisines and cultures represented, um, if we're going to reimagine these dishes, look how beige it is. It's unbelievably beige, isn't it? But veganizing and improving these dishes is fun. If you invest in those skills with young people, you'll be able to. Here we go. This is our updated version of the shepherd's pie. We've got sweet potato mash. We've got basil oil. We've got lentil bolognese underneath. But that oil in the, in the bolognese is going to help them feel like it's a similar food. Like it's, um, and young people need to know that they can also enjoy barbecues. They can have cheese toasties. They can have pancakes on sandwich day. Uh, who wants to give up pizza? You don't have to on the plant-based diet. It's, your, it's, your, um, it's a special occasion. You want a cinnamon roll, it's your birthday. You can still have cake. And I think through celebrating um, this, I'm not saying we should eat these foods the predominant of the time, but it is absolutely important that young people see that they can. And they can do all this without harming animals and caring about the other beautiful life forms on the planet. Now, if breakfast is the most important meal of the day, um, you can see where we're going wrong. Uh, the food industry have convinced us that we should start the day with ultra processed cereals with added sugar. But it, look how far away from the eat well guide it is. I was keen to use the daily dozen to revolutionize the breakfast in the um, lives of these young people. And it's absolutely possible. Here we go. It's overnight oats with uh, chia jam and the fruits to food styling on the top. And they really enjoy this dish. They express themselves, they make flags, they eat mangoes, they talk to each other. And um, it's absolutely possible to um, change the diet of young people, which is what I'm trying to say. We must also talk about economics. It is an absolute privilege to be able to choose what you eat. But oats, chia seed, some plant milk and some frozen berries is within the reach of most of our young people, although we do hope these foods are subsidized. We're talking earlier about um, from the lower socioeconomic groups having to spend 50% of their income um, to eat healthy food. It should be our right, but this is possible. 
Um, this was a reassuring finding from the Oxford study, 40% less. I don't know where this has come from. I think you were talking about it earlier. Um, yes, if you base your diet on convenience foods, it's expensive, but whole foods with these cooking skills, you'll be able to change their minds. Now, lastly, I'd like to celebrate, I think it's the most exciting time for food and innovation um, for centuries. We've now got three ingredients, pancakes that are healthy for you. These have got oats, banana and plant milk in. Um, we, lasagna just means sheep. It's got nothing to do with animals or dairy and we can reimagine these dishes and make them healthier. Katsu is the Japanese word for breadcrumb. We breadcrumb sweet potato and aubergine instead and you can still enjoy this dish. The full plant rather than the full English. We've got, a, we've got a flaxseed egg, we've got scrambled tofu. Uh, kids will enjoy this alternative. It's kind of, I think in, instead of thinking about what, what they're giving up, it's about what they can gain. These are exciting new adventurous times. The roast can be reimagined. Aquafabas giving us frangipan. Cauliflowers can be created into creamy sauces. It's my nature as an educator to want you to take some of this information and to um, impact and improve the lives of the young people in your communities. So here's some of my tips if you want to take and celebrate the plant-based diet. Remember to have fun. It's absolutely fun to do this with young people uh, and you'll enjoy it too. Remember, there is a world between delicious and disgusting. And if we can just ban words like yummy and disgusting and um, yucky for a second, you'll find that kids' curiosity will lead them towards a more diverse diet. Uh, we have this idea that likes and dislikes are permanent and you're a person who likes mushrooms or you're a person who doesn't like apples but it's often the dish itself or the first experience you have of these foods i've used apples because there's 7500 types and there's no way we've tried them all spice is truly the variety of life i think we think about cultural capital a lot in education and trying foods from all around the world absolutely improves the cultural capital of young people. Consider a blender. I think it's one of the only um, pieces of equipment that are, we don't really have creamy in the plant-based diet, but with this, we can create those pancakes that you sh I saw earlier. And you can also create sort of mac and cheese sauces out of butternut squash. Drinks can be healthy too. Just be wary of filling up on carbs before the protein. Hungry kids are a bit more adventurous, not too hungry, um, but maybe um, serve the vegetables and the protein first or limit the carbs at the start. Find your plant-based heroes. There are amazing people in this space and they've really helped inspired me to improve my own understanding of a plant-based diet and share that with others. Be a role model yourself. I was absolutely determined to show that you can be strong and healthy um, on a plant-based diet. And now, yes, we want everyone to be 100% um, plant-based, but I think it's okay to encourage young people to take the steps towards it, one meal at a time. Here at VegFest, there's a whole community of like-minded people, and it takes a team to celebrate and encourage and create change. Uh, together, we can create young people who can thrive on a plant-based diet. Thank you very much for listening.